This is an interview with Hannah Elfshun. Hannah, can I begin by asking you, cast your mind back to when uh, Ron went to Ladicia, what did he hope to achieve there? What was he there for? From what he told us, um, he was there to attempt to uh, create a Scientology community in the country and eventually turn the country over into a Scientology country. He was looking for a home base for Scientology. And how did he react to being deported from there? How was he when he came back? Very guarded at the airport. He was um, a little terse, much terser than I knew him in his lectures at St. Hill, for example. Uh, he, he was to the point. He tried to be his usual sort of ebullient, um, communicative self, but it, it just wasn't the same. He was a lot quieter. So, how did he generally react to being thwarted? Was that something he could handle well? Oh, not at all. I mean, in subsequent years, it, it, each time I was present when he was thwarted in some one of his objectives, he was usually morose, moody, for a period of time, at least for a few weeks at a time. Um, he would isolate himself. Um, for example, on the ship there were periods where he was in his cabin for weeks, moody, petulant, crying on and off, angry, shouting, screaming. Um, one period, um, my office was just above where his cabin was, on the other side of the ship, but just above it, and periodically I could hear things crashing against the bulkheads as if he was throwing dishes and breaking them or throwing something. Um, and I was convinced that that was LRH because that was accompanied by outbursts of crying and shouting, swearing. So he did not take rejection well. Now, tell me about the mission that you were sent on to find an island or perhaps a kingdom, kingdom it might have been. Well, that occurred in 1968 when I was first appointed to one of his aides positions on the ship. Um, I, I came across this folder, I, I'd never heard of this before, I came across this folder, this project to find an island. And it, um, and this was now my, my um, one of my priorities. Um, the, the previous person holding that position had done some preparatory work in riding around and finding islands that were for sale around the world. And um, I had to continue this. Um, there were a number that he was interested in. Some already uh, had docks built and generators and buildings on them. Others were just barren islands. The entire objective was to find a place that Hubbard could eventually turn into his own kingdom with his own government, his own passports, his own monetary system. Uh, in other words, his own principality that he would be the benign dictator of. That was the objective. It never occurred. One was never found that matched his budget or that a country would be willing to cede to him. But that was the objective at the time. So tell me about his decision then to take to the seas and what it was he thought he was up to. That, uh, his decision to take to the high seas occurred sometime in the mid-60s and in retrospect I believe to the extent that he was being thwarted in his um, land objective so to speak, he decided to take to the high seas because in territorial water, outside territorial waters he could do whatever he wanted at whatever time. And he was very down on the English government, and uh, much more so than the American government in 67 and 1968. But um, his secret uh, statements to us, which were marked confidential, were that his sole objective to go into the high seas was to um, be able to do what he wanted when he wanted. So just tell me about that uh, amazing voyage you had on the Avon River. Good. Well, actually, I was not on the voyage from Southampton on the Avon River going down to Las Palmas. I joined the ship in Las Palmas once it was there. So right. I heard many stories about it, but I wasn't there. Can you tell me a little bit about it, that, what you heard? Yes, well, one of my best friends, Yvonne Gillam, now, now deceased, Yvonne Jench, um, was on that journey and she said it was fiasco from start to finish. Hubbard had given them directions on 
basic, a few brief directions on how to navigate and what longitude to sail on and what latitude to reach and this type of thing. She said, they were all green. They didn't have a clue. You know, they got into storms and didn't know how to sail the ship and the ship would be bouncing around like a cork on the ocean. And it was Cabby Runcie, the chief engineer, the Scottish chief engineer who came with the ship, who pretty much got them from the English Channel down to the Canary Islands. I mean, he knew Cabby had been with the ship for years and years, and um, this grizzled old little Scotsman <laughs> got them to where they had to go. Now, what did you all think you were doing? We were saving the world. We, and I think I speak for all 35 of us or so that were there originally in Las Palmas, we were convinced that Hubbard was the returned, n not Messiah, but, but the returned savior, so to speak, and, and that his techniques and his knowledge and, and his majesty would eventually bring all mankind to an enlightened state and save us from the misery we were in and so forth, and um, th that was what we were doing. Now tell me about um, the introduction of ethics and indeed your own role as ethics officer. Oh, the start of a really bad set of experiences. Um, that started in 1967. Hubbard first introduced the, the heavy ethics penalties, the condition of liability, the condition of treason, the condition of doubt. Um, my first experiences with it weren't personal, but I saw Phoebe Maurer one of the crew assigned a condition of, I think it was a condition of liability. She had this gray rag around her arm. She was unwashed for days, no makeup, not allowed to comb her hair, not allowed to eat with a crew. And she was out on deck eating her meals. I wasn't ethics officer yet. And I was, uh, the, the series of shocks I experienced at the time came rapidly one after another. And now looking back, I see it as a, a conditioning into that hard, the harder person that I became, um, the more brittle person I became. Um, that was the first one. The next one was Terry Dickinson, second electrician, who I, by that time I was the ethics officer, the, the master at arms, and Hubbard ordered me to watch over Terry for as long as it took until Terry got a Sharps radio flown from New York and installed on board the Avon River Bridge because he'd failed to do this. And his penalty was, I couldn't let him sleep until he'd done it. And instead of seeing this maybe as a test of my loyalty or being amazed that, that Hubbard could be this brutal, um, because it would take days to get that flown out. I simply accepted this punishment. And Hubbard had told us a little earlier, it's going to take a lot more ethics than any of us know to save the people of this planet. And that's what I accepted, that's what I operated on. I kept Terry up for five days and nights. I kept myself up for five days and nights, no sleep to the point where he was a blathering idiot until that Sharps arrived on board and was installed. And I finally wrote my compliance report to Hubbard. And looking back at it now, you know, I'm, and he was, he was this sort of triumphant, this, this gleam in his eye was like, I'm going to win no matter the cost, no matter who I have to mow down, I'm going to get my objective. And it, all, I, all I had at the end of that was shock again. It was, um, I, didn't, I didn't dare to stand up and question that kind of authority. What was his temperament like by this stage and how brutal did he become? Um, very rapidly, he was getting more and more brutal to the point where the first incident I remember is he put, or one of the first, he put this four-and-a-half-year-old little boy, Derek Green, into the chain locker 
for two days, two days and two nights. Uh, the chain locker is that part of the ship right up in the front of the ship where the chain is kept when the ship isn't out in the ocean. And it's a, 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 it's a closed metal container. The, the chain is coiled up in it. It's wet. It's full of water and seaweed. It smells bad, mud. Um, and um, there's only an escape hatch out and then the horse pipe through which the chain runs. So it's dark uh, when the chain is in there or when the chain is out, it's dark. But Derek was sitting up on the chain in this place on his own in the dark for two days and two nights. He was not allowed to go to the party. I mean, he had to go in the chain locker on his own, soil himself. He was given food. And uh, I, wasn't, I never went near it, uh, the chain locker, while he was in there, but people heard him crying. Um, that is sheer, total brutality. I, that is, that, that's, um, that's child abuse, you know. I mean, these days, you know, people are, are locked up, imprisoned for child abuse. Mm -hmm. And this had happened to Derek because he happened to wander into an area where Hubbard's telexes were being worked with. He ate part of a Hubbard telex and he threw David Ziff's jewelry case overboard. Well, these are the kinds of things that small children will do if they're not looked after. Tell me about when he made you the captain of the ship. Early, early 1968, on uh, the, the journey Mission Into Time, as it was called. The purpose of this was to verify, uh, try to verify Hubbard's past lives in the Mediterranean. Um, I, I really look upon it as, a, as a, a trip to verify Hubbard's um, uh, his, his, his ego, to, to, to bolster his ego, that, that he was really all, lived all these famous past lives. But um, halfway through the voyage, the captain, Joe von Staden, fell into disfavor with Hubbard because he was too questioning. Hubbard liked people who were very compliant. So... Um, Hubbard called me into his office one night, um, told me that I was going to be made the captain. I was the chief officer, so I was next in line. And I went away in shock. A few minutes later, I think he saw me just sitting at my desk in shock, called me into his cabin, plunked some cans into my hand, stood right in the doorway of his cabin, fiddling with the e-meter, and I started asking me questions about when I had last been a captain. Well, this could only be past lives because I'd never been a captain in this life. So I started, you know, thinking back and came up with a few experiences that might be, might not be. And he urged me further back, further back, until I found this one experience. To this day, I, I can't, you know, I don't know if this was the truth or not. I, I've simply ended up with, I don't know, as far as the veracity of these past experiences. But... Um, he questioned me about it and I gave him answers and he got more and more jubilant at the end. So I knew I was on the right track. I knew I was giving him what he wanted because he was, you know, g going more and more up and up and he was, he was happy with what I was coming up with about this past experience about being a space captain of a spaceship and being blown up in space and the planet was being invaded and all these, this, all this fighting and blasting going on and, and so forth. And at the end of it, he peered over the e-meter at me and he said, were you one of the loyal officers? And when I looked at him, and this, didn't, this had no meaning to me at all. And I just simply said to him, Sir, I don't know. He finally said, OK, OK, and took the cans away. And he said, you'll do fine now, you'll do fine. And I wandered out on deck, and, and suddenly it hit me. I had a peak experience. I realized that I had to have been someone in the past may be connected to something special because of his responses to what I was telling him. And at that point, you know, I got this up rush. I got this adrenaline rush and I felt good. I must have been one of those loyal officers. I must have been one of the elite, you know. And then he saw me later on and I nodded to him and smiled and he gave me this great big beam back because he got that communication, you know, that I realized what he had asked me, and it was okay. You know. But just so that we know, you were what? 
early 20s? Oh, I was, I was 24 years old. I'd, I'd been on a cruise ship once. I had no experience at all. I, I, I knew what he had taught us on the bridge, and he had taught us well. He'd taken a few of us and taught us. And, but apart from that, no. I had no sea experience at all. In early 68, uh, Hubbard announced on board the Apollo that he was going to do this, um, this mission to verify past lives and that he had lived. He, he gave us a brief précis on the, the fact that he lived these various past lives in the Mediterranean, been a Phoenician captain and uh, been a wealthy landowner in Italy and so on and had buried treasure in various places and he wanted to go back and find those locations, verify them, verify the treasure was buried and if possible retrieve the treasure. So on the Apollo, then called the Royal Scotman, it hadn't been named the Apollo yet, uh, we were in a, in a tizzy, you know, all this, this excitement of this upcoming very important mission. And um, I was amongst one of the chosen and um, we sailed off with our T-scopes and M-scopes, our metal detectors, and went to a variety of locations and did find, uh, did, did find some where obviously metal was buried. Um, what Hubbard would do is we'd sail into a location that was possibly one of the locations. Hubbard would do a, a clay model from, apparently, from his memory uh, as to what the location looked like. There was a headland over here with an old fortress on it and then the bay receded background and there was a convent over there and so on. And a few of us that were going ashore would study the clay model, get into the little ships, go ashore see if we could verify that the terrain looked that way or that there had been an old fortress on the peninsula here and so forth. Come back to the ship, report our findings to him. And either it was a yes sir, this looks like it could be the terrain, at which point he would come ashore to verify it himself. If it wasn't, we'd sail off to the next point that might be the, the, the location. And um, one, of the, one of the ones which um, in his little booklet, Mission Into Time, one of the ones in which I mentioned in the booklet was uh, in Sardinia, this, um, uh, this uh, I think it was called the Temple of Nora, the site of Nora, N-O-R-A, in uh, which we did find, we did um, use the metal detector and locate it at the basement of what he claimed used to be a temple in which he had liaisons with some some priestess during his trips to Sardinia um, was uh, there was metal, metal buried down below and um, he was uh, very triumphant during those times that uh, he would strut around in his island outfit I used to call it he had an outfit for every occasion and he would have his explorer hat on and his bush jackets and or his big capes and he'd you know come come onto the island with his cape billowing in the wind. It was all, it was all very arty and, and very, um, it was very heady stuff for us people because he played the role and that somehow magnified the importance of the, the, the history that he was making, the story that he was telling and the impact it had on the followers. He was, um, and then the the, the, the gleam in his eye and the and the, 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 the fulfillment of the prophecy. You see, I told you this is correct. This is, you know, it had it had a very magical, magnetic, um, hypnotizing effect on the followers. Did you actually ever do any treasure up? No, never. Um, now, whether by whether by chance or what, um, for example. Uh, Sicily and Sardinia were, I think, under the Italian government. Most of any treasure dug up, like 90, 95%, 92%, 99%, goes automatically to the government. So that the founder, that the discoverer, gets only a very small percent. And Hubbard categorically stated, when I dig up that treasure, I want all of it. It's mine. It's not going to go to a government. He planned to uh, retrieve the treasure by getting two flat-bottomed, long, long boat sleds built in Valencia, Spain, specially to his specifications, so that one dark, moonless night he could get his um, Sea Org members to glide up onto a beach with their digging equipment, creep ashore, 
and dig up the treasure silently and retrieve it and get it back into the boats and back to the ship. And he spoke to us about that several times on board, um, first the Avon River and then the Royal Scotman. Um, he was determined he was going to get that back. And he already had plans, as he said, as he put it, to find the deepest vault in Spain and bury this treasure in the deepest vault in Spain. And that statement stuck with me for the longest time because later on, many years later, when I heard about the Swiss bank accounts and how much money was in those, I thought, that's right. He loved the idea of burying treasure, money, in vaults and just hoarding it. That was what he wanted. Okay. Uh, now, tell me about the uh introduction of the RPF, which was obviously a very uh, brutal thing. Um, in 1973, um, Hubbard had a, an accident in Portugal and got pretty badly um, injured, I think his arm and his back. And he was in his cabin after that for a number of weeks. This was his period, which I call the pouting, the crying, the, the mad period, where he would cry and throw things against the wall, the, the bulkheads, and pout and scream. Um, he was in a bad way. I don't know what offset that period of moroseness and um, crying and so on, but right toward the tail end of that, he created the RPF, the Rehabilitation Project Force. The first inkling I had of it was when his personal communicator, Ken Urquhart, came into my office with this series of papers, documents, um, that outlined the Rehabilitation Project Force. And there were about seven or eight uh, various um, documents. And um, I had to read through them. I forget why I had to read through them before they went down to Mimeo to be typed up and, and edited and, and um, issued, published. And I was I was absolutely horrified when I read them because they talked about the creation of this pretty much like a slave labor camp. Those weren't the words used, but that was the impression given, where the unwanted, those found wanting, seriously wanting, were, uh, were sent, and they were to be kept in this with no rights, no freedoms, no privileges of any kind, pretty much the basic rights they were allowed were a little bit of sleep each day, food leftovers, um, the harshest treatment, they were not allowed to speak to any of the crew, um, and so forth, and they had to rehabilitate themselves with no help from anyone else until they could become, they were accepted back as crew again. And the people who were who were relegated to this this position, this this demeaning position, had maybe hadn't met Hubbard's standards, maybe had had a meter phenomenon on the e meter, which meant that they were harboring negative ideas about Hubbard or about the ship or about Hubbard's designs or goals, um, and that horrified me as well that something that simple could be used to invoke this kind of terrible punishment on someone. All of us were there of our free will. All of us were there because we wanted to help Hubbard. How could somebody be found this wanting? Um, shortly thereafter, the, these people who were found, the first ones chosen to be put into the RPF, uh, were appointed and they're, they're, the place they slept was lower hold number one. That was chosen. The bow, the pit of the ship. There was no light in there. A few light bulbs were strung across the top of the hold. There was only one steep, steep ladder companionway down into the hold. It was the storage place for some of Hubbard's archival material in, in huge big uh, suitcases and so on were down there. Otherwise, apart from that, a few mattresses were thrown down on the, on the decking. And this is, where, this is where the crew slept. They had the herdsmen, uh, one of the set of um, heads, toilets and, and wash basins, 
was relegated for their use up on deck. Um, used to be used by the herdsmen who watched over the cattle when, when the Apollo was a cattle ferry. And they were allowed to use that head. And they ate their meals on the poop deck at the back of the ship out of huge cauldrons into which all the leftovers from the crew had been dumped. And I once saw them out back. Uh, the, the huge cauldrons were brought up from the galley, put on deck, and these people went over and with their bare hands in their filthy, dirty skivvies were eating out of these big pots. And it was like, I felt I was watching something out of, you know, the medieval history period. It was, it was very, very, very bad that this was going on. But Hubbard's statement to us was that it's going to take a lot more ethics and a lot more punishment than anyone has, can easily face up to, to get this whole world back in shape. And at that point, I believe that statement. You know, one of the other things you did was um, uh, overboarding. Could you just tell me what happened there and how some people were chained behind when they went to have blindfolds, that sort of thing, and what sort of thing they would have done with that punishment? Yes. Um, in 1968, Hubbard held what he called his first uh, class 8 technical training period on board the ship, on board the Apollo in Greece. We were in Corfu at the time and as punishment for those who didn't um, do their assignments, their auditing assignments correctly, they, they goofed in their auditing assignments, they were overboarded, they were thrown overboard in a ceremony held every morning in the harbour. And now you know, you think of throwing somebody overboard and it seems fairly shocking. It, it seems shocking enough. But the, harb the harbour where we were was right at the end of, of, a, of a pier where the water collected. So there was a lot of oil, a lot of refuse, a lot of um, old papers and, and garbage and stuff floating in the water, rubbish floating in the water. And so people were thrown overboard into this rubbish, into this dirty, filthy water, which was bad enough. Um, but some of them were actually thrown overboard if you had a second offence or a third offence or a multiple offence. The penalty increased and you were thrown overboard with a blindfold or with hands tied behind your back or with your hands and feet tied. And I saw one woman, um, Julia Lewis Salmon from the United States thrown overboard. This woman must have been in her fifties. Um, she was, had her hands and I think her feet tied, maybe only her hands tied and a blindfold. But she went over, she was so panicked at the thought of being thrown over this way. She was standing on the edge of the deck, panicked, um, beside herself, shouting. I'd, it, I, I was afraid that she was going to have a heart attack or, or something. And I was standing on, on the A-deck with Hubbard and his other aides watching this, this going on. And Julia didn't jump over, she had to be pushed over because she was incapable, she was in such a, a fit. And she fell into the water at some odd angle, screaming and spluttering. And I, I truly think she would have gone under. I think somebody else had to jump into the water and help her get off her blindfold and undo her hands and get her to the side of the ship where she could climb up the bosun's ladder. Um, what was uh, coming ashore now? What was his master plan for coming ashore in Florida? What was he up to there? Well, when when he fi when Hubbard finally decided to come ashore from the ships, um, all we had uh, the, the ship itself and and the the Scientology aspect of the ship had grown so unpopular in the Mediterranean and the Caribbean that we'd run out of territory to sail. That was what prompted the move back into the United States. And um, the master plan was try to get everyone ashore into Florida and then secretly, quietly set up a base of operation from which eventually it would surface that it was Scientology. So we were brought ashore in Miami and taken up to Daytona where we stayed for a month or two while the Fort Harrison Hotel in Clearwater was purchased. When we came ashore um, in 1975, um, Hubbard 
devised a strategy for um, moving into clear water. And um, the strategy, he was, he was very um, conspiratorial. He loved the intrigue of planning and plotting to evade authority. Again, evade authority. He was always so triumphant when he managed to win over authority. And um, which reminds me, and I'll, I'll tell you just very briefly, on the Apollo in 1968, we were up on deck. There was just a few of us with him at one point. And he said to us, he turned around and said to us in a very sort of masterful um, way, in a very almost ambassadorial sort of way, he said, um, it's perfectly all right to step outside the law because the law itself is aberrated. So in order to achieve our ends, that gives us license to step outside the law. Anyway, back to, back to um, Daytona. He held a series of meetings in which he planned the fronts that he would use in order to, um, uh, to get Scientology into clear water. And the first was Southern Land Development Corporation, SDLC. And um, he, uh, his representatives, representatives would go into Florida. The hotel would be purchased by SDLC. And um, when that cover was blown, the next cover would be United Churches. And if that cover was blown, then uh, Scientology would surface. And uh, I was in on a number of assignments where we had to go to the Fort Harrison Hotel. Even before it was purchased, it was still part of the Jack Tar chain of hotels um, in Florida and the East Coast. And we had to survey the hotel, see what its condition was like, whether it needed cleaning and so forth and so on. And then later on I went in with a, with a few other people to assign the spaces where the birthing would occur and the regging would occur and this would occur and the auditing would be done and so forth. Um, Did he was, plan to take over the town, which is almost what happened? Definitely. Well, that was ultimately... He, one of the, he joked about choosing clear water because he liked the name of the city. He thought it was very appropriate. And his, the, the plan was eventually to take over and create it as a Scientology bastion. Yes. Great. Now tell me about his paranoia. Uh, I know you mentioned about Lisbon 73 and what he was like then and, and what he was like when he came back, but, but also his paranoia in general. There were during the period that I knew him and worked with him about eight years, um, and especially in retrospect, it's clear to me that his moments of paranoia increased. Both they lengthened in the duration that he experienced them, but they also increased. And um, he would go into moments of rage um, long, long moments, by moments I mean like days, where he would be um, shouting, screaming, moody, he would be uh, petulant like a child, um, complaining about this, complaining about that, um, fearful that the ship was being, that Scientology on board was being, um, uh, the plants were coming on board, was being infiltrated by the governments and the CIA and the FBI and uh, the crew would go through, uh, periodically uh, would be security checked to make sure that no plants had gotten on board, that we were being infiltrated. Um, one of those moments was when he put together the RPF in early 1974. His fear at that point, I think, peaked, and that was the creation of the RPF, to both punish people, to get them to redeem themselves, but also to make sure through lengthy security checks that people were not plants. Um, Tell me about when he uh, fled from Lisbon, at the time of the French court case, and what he was like then, and what he was like when he came back. Another of those moments was in 1972, I believe it was, when, 73, when he fled from Lisbon um, to the America and hid out for a year in Queens, New York. Um, there was a French case going on, a, a case of a litigation was going on in France against Scientology and Hubbard was uh, 
had been uh, was about to be indicted or had been indicted was to be served and um, because he did not want to be extradited from Portugal to France he fled to America for a year and hid before he left the ship he was very um, I, I would say scared he kept to himself in his cabin did not go ashore which was unlike him any time we got to a port where we stayed for a period of time he would get his cars put ashore he would get his motorbike put ashore he had a great big Harley Davidson that he would love to go riding on in of course in his riding outfit another outfit that he had um, but in Lisbon he stayed on the ship until the point where he left and fled to New York and then when he came back a year later, um, he arrived back on ship triumphant. Again, he had evaded authority. He came back, he was bouncy, he was up, he was pretty much racing around, beaming, you know, from ear to ear. The, the court case was over, he was safe, he was back on board. Okay. How important was making money to him? Making money, I think, to Hubbard was paramount. He was obsessed with the idea, both in retrieving the treasure that we had talked about and also in coming ashore in 1975. He stated a number of times in the briefings he gave us when he was planning those strategies of his as to how to get into clear water that coming ashore would be profitable because we could get so many more people to the flag land base, as it was to be called, for auditing and training. And he also wanted to concentrate on getting professionals to the land base because, of course, they had more accessible money. They had pension funds, they had children's education funds, and some of these he named um, that were accessible. Okay. But money, it wasn't money for its own sake, was it? It was money for power. I would say yes, not yes, the, the money that he wanted Do, uh, predominantly was for power. Um, not he was, he wasn't that interested in it for himself. He did have perks. He did have his cars, his motorbikes, his books, his good food, his, and things like that. But, and eventually he had his his villas and he had his estates and so on. But he was mainly interested in amassing the money. Um, I th I think he knew that having those resources, those hordes and hordes of money put away would eventually get him out of any spot that he might get into. Okay, I'm just going to ask you something which I didn't say I was going to ask you, but you've mentioned a couple of times. Just tell me about his love of dressing up and having the right uniform for the right thing and what that shows him as a fanboy as a character. From the first time I, I saw Hubbard at, during the St. Hill Special Briefing Course Lectures in 1966 onward, I saw him dress up in so many costumes that I can't count the number. He had a costume for L. Ron Hubbard the artist, he had a costume for L. Ron Hubbard the lecturer, he had a costume, a, a different ride, a outfit when he went out on his Harley Davidson, he had an outfit when he went out photographing in, in the Caribbean, he had an outfit when he would have dinner with his family. I mean, he changed constantly. He wouldn't have, he had his outfit when he was the captain on the bridge. And this lent a certain mystique to the man because not only did his word count to his followers, but in presentation, there he was um, living what he was preaching, so to speak. One of the, one of the characteristics I think though that gave him away was and I noticed this every time he went on stage so to speak at St. Hill in England when he would be up in front of his audience talking into a mic he would caricature he would pose he would pull his face in various ways which always made almost made him look ridiculous but he would he would pantomime and caricature things that he was talking about and it gave away a side of him that made him look less than the God he wanted to portray himself as. And this happened not only at St. Hill but also on the ship, but it only surfaced now and then. Finally, Hannah, can I ask you, what's his legacy? 
Hubbard's legacy. Um, it's a, it's twofold, threefold, I would say. Um, there's the side of him that that is revered by followers. Um, that he has um, him, that he himself has desperately tried to emphasize and to leave. And you know, on reflection, it seems to me that that is the side that is being. Um, that is being most enhanced currently by his followers. Then there is the other, the other aspect of his legacy, legacy, which is the brutal one. It's the the inhumane one. The, it's the one which, almost to uh, to, to paraphrase him, um, we will achieve our ends no matter the cost. And that's the legacy that he's left in his policies, in his bulletins, in his, in his writings. That's the legacy that, again, it appears to me um, his followers are attempting to rewrite history on. They're attempting to bury, they're attempting to uh, make less known, they're attempting to hide. But that's the hidden side that is very scary and that's the hidden side that will continue because that's Hubbard. To achieve his ends at all costs, no matter who is injured, no matter who is no matter who is hurt, that is the one that will occur.